So it's always good to go right after lunch. The, uh, if I see people nodding off, I know why, which is fine. I'll, I'll claim it's not because of my remarks. It's because you had a great lunch. The, um, so uh, as Lee said, um, a retired infantry colonel, I had a lot of time to practice some of this stuff. And uh, I think back to when I came in in the early 90s, late 80s at West Point, early 90s. And I thought one of my first assignments was in Korea. I was in the 2nd Infantry Division. I stayed for a second year, became a long-range surveillance XO. And at the time, I thought we were super high speed with the equipment on hand at the time. We had uh, seven meter slant antennas you have to put up by hand that could allow you to talk for about 20 miles. So we thought we were, it was just this technology was amazing. <clears throat> then fast forward and 30 years later, 25 years later, um, you see what's out there and it's, it's pretty amazing. Um, and I think what's gonna happen over the next 20 or 30 years, it will be equally amazing. Um, I also think that a lot of the folks, especially probably in the front row and, and in this room, we're not the ones that'll be doing that fight in 20 to 30 years. Um, while we still have a stake in it, many of us may have kids in the, in the, uh, that are gonna be doing this. My daughter just started her freshman year at um, Colorado School of Mines in the Army ROTC. She will be a junior field grade officer, hopefully by then, if she goes active duty. And by the time she retires at the end of that period, if she stays in, um, she'll be you know, a 30 year colonel, potentially, or wh however things turn out. And I think back to the, when I came in the service, we inherited some pretty crystal ball activities with airland battle equipment with the big five that ended up serving the army perfectly during the Gulf War. But what's missing, and I think what's harder and harder because of the complexity of things, is that this competitive edge of manufacturability that I'll talk about, it's not so much can you get it perfect on the equipment and the things you need, but because of the advances in manufacturing and advanced manufacturing itself, I think we'll be able to build a capability that allows us to create the things we need once we know we need them very fast and quickly. And so that's just a different way to potentially think about things, and that's what I'll get into. So, um, like I said, I'm convinced that the rate of the development of manufacturability, and first off, manufacturability, I define it, it's simple definition. Um, it's the extent to which good or product can be manufactured with relative ease at minimum cost with a maximum amount of reliability. That's what we're all shooting for. So I'm convinced that there's some, there's the manufacturability of things can help provide both strategic, operational, and tactical advantages in a competitive edge to the Army and to the military over time. So to get started, I represent a number of organizations, like Lee said, um, all of these have some contact with a group called the Manufacturing USA Network which you can see here, and I'll talk that for a moment, and this is really the hat with which I'm wearing here. Um, I'm joined by Dr. Eric Forsyth and Dr. Suresh Sitaraman, who from Georgia Tech and the Army Research Lab, and uh, they'll come up with me on stage afterwards um, for the question and answer period. But uh, Eric's the program manager for NextFlex. Um, I do the workforce development activities for this institute as well, and education and training. Um, I have a, a role within the Department of Energy had as an ORISE fellow to help do the cross-institute coordination in a number of areas, and so I'm relatively familiar with most of the institutes. Um, the purpose of these institutes, you can see there on the slide, it's a national network. They're each with a specialized technology focus, if you can see the slides, I'll talk through some of them, but it's really designed by the previous administration, put forth this very bipartisan focus as a means to help recapture and secure the future of manufacturing in the U.S. The, uh, the institute activities include applied research and demonstration projects to reduce the cost and risk of commercializing new technologies. Um, it's all about workforce development. It's all about small and medium folks in the supply chain helping the big companies uh, produce the things that are needed. Um, you can see that it's 14 institutes total. The first one was in 2012. The last ones were announced uh, just in January and they each are on five-year, 75 million-ish grants from the Departments of Defense, Energy, or Commerce to, do, to perform the tasks they're supposed to perform over five years and during that time become sustainable. Um, a billion dollars of federal funding put into these institutes over five years to increase the manufacturability of things with two billion in non-federal funding in matching and activities. Uh, 1,300 public-private sector partners and they're in over 40 states. So some of the institutes, um, I'll just highlight a few of them as we go around. Um, NextFlex, where we're at, focused on flexible hybrid electronics. Um, 
Out in the Northeast, you got the Advanced Tissue Biofabrication Institute that was just um, announced. Lightweight metals um, in Detroit, auto and uh, airline industry, it makes sense. You have the Advanced Composites Institute out of Knoxville, Tennessee. Um, wide band gap power run by retired Major General Nick Justice at Power America in North Carolina. Um, Digital Manufacturing and Design Institute in Chicago. The Advanced uh, Fibers Institute in Boston, uh, Photonics Institute in Rochester, Robotics, et cetera. So all of these institutes, like I said, they are, they're going to be what helps us learn how to make things as much as the products they actually make. The, uh, one of the things the institute's focused on is what you're familiar with, is the, the valley of death or the gap between research and development and private sector activities. What's uh, fairly well known, I'm sure, in the room is that more than four in five technologies developed on the left side of this chart never make it to the right side of the chart to commercialization. So think about that, 100 ideas on the left side and less than 20 make it over to the right side for, for you know, whatever reason. It is. It's uh, often due to businesses and investors um, failing to understand the true market potential of a given technology and the risk reward elements. We had a, at the Defense Manufacturing Conference in November, it was held in Denver this year, and there was a discussion amongst institute leaders and some of the, the business leaders, the tier one members and schools that a lot of the activity that takes place on the left side, you have to have a conversation about what's, a, what's going on in the right side of that chart to be able to, it's both a push and a pull system. And we kind of developed a new way to think of it. It's not necessarily, this is just a new Venn diagram. There's been three out of five presentations this morning that had a Venn diagram, so we had to have one as well. But the, uh, you think about what was on the previous slide, and you have the research and development or the creative and innovative product or process ideas. You have the bottom circle there with the education workforce development. I added in entrepreneurship and training because it's not just, it's the, the innovation inside of big companies, but it's also the small companies that are there. And then up on the right side, it's not just commercialization, but it's dual use commercialization. And you think of this, this is a, this is a Venn diagram that isn't static, it moves up and to the right continuously. And it has ripple effects that the commercialization informs both the people side on that bottom circle as well as the research and development side. Research and development happens independently. It, it happens in its own, uh, on its own accord that informs the commercialization, but that uh, information also goes both ways. The, uh, one of the things that when I, I gave a similar uh, discussion of this to a group at Moffett Field about a month ago, and there was this question about dual use, and I don't think that that's, it's not as prevalently known as you would think. Uh, in this case, what I mean by dual use isn't just a multi, multiple uses for a component, but it's dual use both in the military or in the national security sector as it is in the commercial sector. And that's important because in order to truly commercialize something or to make it worthwhile for a large company or anyone to make, they gotta be able to generate revenue from it. They gotta be able to, to make money so that they can invest in themselves, invest in the people doing these things and, and scale that over time, which then takes the pressure off of the, uh, the inside the service or in government um, manufacturing processes. So this is a great example. Our executive director, Malcolm Thompson, talks about this one quite a bit. So this is a, um, one of the technologies within the Flexible Hybrid Electronics Manufacturing Innovation Institute. It's essentially a human health monitoring patch. So think of a CVS bandage you'd put on an on a abrasion or a wound. It's similar in terms of its size and its, its flexibility. But it, through a, a flexible hybrid electronics process, using microfluidics, you can read in the sweat, comes into an absorptive, absorptive pad, it goes through a sensor, it's the sweat's wicked away, and then you're able to read, once you figure out what they are, certain biomarkers that indicate something in your, in your body. What you'd previously have to do through a draw of blood, and through that draw of blood, you're only getting a snapshot, this can do it continuously. So the dual use component, it applies, the original thought was the Department of Air Force would use this to monitor pilots' cognitive abilities. But they realized pilots have a lot of external stimuli keeping them engaged in the activities they're doing. You then think drone pilots sitting in containerized housing units somewhere flying these things, they are probably a more appropriate in-service 
user of this application. While our executive director was at a talk called Blood, Sweat, and Tears, it was the conference, uh, and a pediatrician um, who worked in a premature ward asked him, this technology would be fantastic. We have premature babies that would, that would be able to use this because we can't draw blood. And that game-changing nature of that technology where something that was designed here as a dual-use component that can be make a lot of money solving, and more importantly, some really big problems. So that's what we mean, going back to that last slide, by dual use. It's those things that are available within the national security environment, not just defense, but it could be um, energy, it could be commerce, it could be agriculture, it could be whatever it is that gives some kind of uh, advantage to the activities that the government wants to see done for its uh, reasons and its organization but it also has the ability and incentives exist for companies to want to make those things as well. So it's a great example, and uh, we'll be able to talk a little bit more about the technology at the end if you're interested in, in the uh, question and answer period. To that end, when I talk about manufacturability, I'll talk just a couple examples on the next few slides. This, uh, this is our institute, specifically the Flexible Hybrid Electronics Manufacturing Institute. And what you see up top is what you're all familiar with is a printed circuit board. It's what's in this device, it's what's in your TV, it's you pick up your phone, that's what's in it. It's sil rigid silicon substrates, and that's what all those silicon chips and the, the bonding and everything that takes place on it is very inflexible. You have to package and your form factor is limited by that printed circuit board. But through some additional processes and through the manufacturability of things, what you see on this bottom left is that's a 250 micron thick silicon die. This is a 25 micron thick silicon die. This doesn't bend, this does, with the same amount of computing power. You then have different types of bonding and, and attach activities here to allow you to do, essentially take this and have it do this. And that's what's pretty neat about the manufacturability of things. It's also what this is in, these materials, there's, it's, it's almost up to your imagination of what you, you put these electronics in. It's not limited to that silicon circuit board and then you wrap the package around it. You now can have this be part of whatever, whatever activity you have. What, the way, example I like to think about is um, you could make the squad radio part of the handguard on an individual weapon. So the handguard is the radio. So that's just one example of some, what this technology can do to really blend some products over time. Some of the other institute focus areas, this ball of mess here is actually smart fiber from the Advanced Functional Fibers Institute. So one of the things with the, uh, with a FOA is what it's called, it uh, produces fabrics that see, hear, sense, communicate, store and convert energy, regulate temperature, monitor health and change color. One of the examples they use when they give their presentation is they'll uh, use this type of material printed in uniforms or, or manufactured in uniforms for friend or foe identification through certain optics. That's extremely reliable at distance. Someone on a rooftop, uh, overwatch position, can clearly see what's going on inside the building in friend or foe identification and status reporting and, and whatever else you need it to do. The other thing about this institute and one of the things they talk about, all the chairs you're sitting on are wasted space electronically, that fabric, the clothes we wear, the carpet. You know, these could be doing tasks for us that are basically your chairs in your car. Through smart fiber technology, you can utilize and, and have those actually perform certain functions. This is a, uh, an interesting, really interesting application. Anyone ever, has anyone seen this or familiar with this picture or what this is? So this was, yeah, in, uh, at the manufacturing demonstration facility at Oak Ridge National Labs in partnership with the Advanced Composites Institute the principal investigators, along with several companies and uh, University of Tennessee ecosystem, decide, you can see the Oak Ridge logo there, that's the Easter egg in the picture. Um, they decided to 3D print a car and 3D print a functional living quarters. And you can wirelessly share the energy between the two. And so what they did is they, they printed this in a series of structures in a large, I think it was a Cincinnati printing machine, a 3D printer, it's about as big as this stage. And then they printed the car, they put it all together. And so the solar comes into the house, the car pulls up, 
and if the car needs to recharge, the, the house will pass energy to the car. Vice versa, if the car comes back and there's a deficit of energy in the house, the car will pass some energy over to the, it just automatically regulates and transforms this. Now, what does this look like? I often thought for my 15 months in Baghdad, that looked kind of like a chew I lived in. So instead of having to push all these things over there, maybe you, yeah, it does look like a chew. And that looks like you're on the fob little vehicle there. But just think about some of the applications you could do. You could test this out fairly easily at the National Training Center. And the manufacturability of things means instead of pushing over thousands and thousands of containerized housing units and vehicles, you push the carbon fiber or the other materials that are used to make it. And then you have a, maybe a little bit um, more, you push things closer to the users so that you can make these things a little bit more tailored and a little bit more applicable. And I'll talk about the customization in a moment. So that's, I really love that example, and they, they're taking that even further. Another example they have that isn't in the picture that I thought about using was they, they actually printed a Shelby Cobra, and those of you that are familiar with what they're doing at Oak Ridge, it's pretty amazing stuff. The, uh, and then lastly, I just talked with Industry 4.0 and the, the Digital Manufacturing Institute, the, the data discussions from this morning, the machine learning, that applies to manufacturing as well. I, I had a question I was gonna ask this morning uh, for the two speakers this morning about where does, is there, any, is there any work done thus far towards machine learning as it passes to machines making things? So how do you, for instance, an application, a squad comes back or a patrol comes back from whatever they're doing and they want to then inform some kind of, uh, the machine learning aspect of what their problems were, that then informs, it, it creates a CAD file, it creates a CAM file, it creates whatever it is that might be something that's engineerable and then manufactured so that the next time they go out on an activity, there's a new device that can perform that activity. So can the machines that learn also inform the machines that make through interaction with the users? And I think the answer is yes, but how far along can we get on this? And, and where's the investment gonna come from? And what's the, what's the commercial application that'll help speed this along? So those are some examples of what I mean by manufacturability uh, specifically. So getting into now versus 2030 to 2050, you know, this is my favorite part, but when it applies to manufacturing in particular, there's this discussion of now, and really in the, we went through an industrial revolution that allowed us to make things at volume and then we're into a, a, a customer revolution recently in the past several decades or most recently uh, that make things with unique features that people want. And it was always a, a idea between customization or high volume. You couldn't really get both. Think high volume is iPhones made in China. But when you want to be able to make, you want someone to be able to walk into a Nike store and put your foot in a readable sensor and then the next day you get a pair of Nikes mailed to you because you filled it out on a catalog, online catalog in the store and it'll mail them to you the next day exactly for your foot. You want a four millimeter heel drop, you want this, you want that, it, you want this color, it's perfect. My wife would love it because she can never find a pair of pants that fits exactly right. It's, think about it, you walk into a TSA sensor type apparatus, you just get your measurements if you're a soldier and the next day, or whenever it is, you have all your uniforms sent, they're the perfect size, your boots, you have all of uh, whatever isoprep information you would need for uh, personal recovery down the road and anything else you wanted to throw into the mix. Um, so that customization at any volume really comes down to, it's you have, um, you have this term called egonomics, which is I want it the way I want it now, which from my time in the army was most of the people in the front row want things the way they want it right now. But that applies to also everyone in the service. When you go out, what you want to do and how you want to do things. And if we can um, somehow have this balance between the high volume or what's the rate of volume that you need to produce versus the demand volatility. Is it going to go, do you, have to, do you have to produce a lot of things? Do you have to produce a little bit of things? When do you need them? All these variables could apply in a very dynamic environment. So the manufacturability of things, the learning that's going into doing that for the private sector can apply, I think, quite nicely to what's going on in the services. That's really where we get into the, the uh, supply chain discussion. With that mix of 
that mixed equation between volume and demand volatility. And I think we'll see that like the companies have reshored certain manufacturing activities, it was to deal with variance in demand volatility so that you could make things closer to the user and the customer. And so folks at the Manufacturing Industrial Base Policy Office and others in other, um, other branches of the government think through this when they think about how, the, um, how to get industry right and the companies are thinking through this too, but that same principle, I'll argue when we get to some of the vignettes, could apply when you position things forward in theater. Where do you actually make the things that people use? Right now, we're fairly, it's done in the US, it's done by private sector organizations on contract with the government. What if that equation changed a little bit? Single function versus multifunctional products. Um, imagine if 15 years ago you wanted to use your phone, go to the library, have a GPS, play game night with your family, watch TV, have a notepad, a computer, and a movie theater. And you'd have to have all these different things and all this stuff. Well, right now, lift up your phone and you all know that's what you got. So you have this very multifunctional product. The same goes through in the future. That was 10 years ago, and look where things have come when it was the first iPhone was released. Think about where it's gonna go in the future. Think about what it means to weapon systems combined with radios, combined with whatever. It's gonna be pretty amazing what you can, you can actually package together into multi-use products for in-service use. And then, you know, we're at, we've always been at the early stage prototypes of whatever's next. So, and then, but think about getting to scale production on some of these things. And the ability to do that scaled production will be because of the manufacturability of things that the institutes are focused on. So, I thought it'd be fun to just think through some of these, uh, based off these advances in manufacturability of things. What, you know, I said, will it be likely that, but maybe, or what if, or whatever we want to call it as a mad scientist and what Lee's going to lead us through over the next few years. So here's some things to think about. And I, I like, I'll talk about each one of these in terms of what I think the problem is for me personally that I was able to at least interact with. So this first one, the command post as a self-driving, fully connected server farm. So when my three deployments to Iraq, 2004, first one, last one, 2010-ish, and then finished up as the G3 in Korea, and the, the, what command post turned into from the first one, which was a expando van operating on an MSE backbone, a mobile subscriber equipment backbone, and able to, very mobile, but not a lot of not a lot of power other than voice communications to do things. And then at the time, we we're just getting fielded. If for those of you who want to time warp back into transitioning from like MCS Lite to whatever, whatever the next one was, we went into CPOF after that. Um, it was like getting AMDUs with ASAS with all these other systems around that time. So, and we still did our net calls on TaxAt that first deployment at the division level, we still did a lot of things like had been done 20 years prior. But then in just a, a rapid amount of time, by the deployment to Baghdad, we were on CPOF, and then we were operating with our Iraqi counterparts in our command posts on CPOF, and we had this huge back room that had all of our server equipment and everything, and power generation, while the command post still looked kind of the same with the U-shaped, you know, your warfighting functions represented to allow for battle command and for the commander to make decisions and for the staff to help him visualize, describe, and direct those activities. So what happens if we can now take what turned into the D main in 2010 in BIAP or Spiker, this huge facility, but what if you could take all that computing power and put it back into an expando van? And I think that's just an example of the manufacturability of things, the the way to creatively package electronics and, and certain items and power generation and, and all these other, and mobility to do. So that's that first one, that solving that problem of what I had in Korea as the G3 for 2ID was we were fixed at the Camp Red Cloud bunker. We, it was very hard to move the D-Main to do anything. You just, we didn't, you didn't have the MTO vehicles to do it anymore. So that's just a, I, I like that vignette in terms of what things will be able to uh, turn into. The tracked and wheeled vehicles, a third, a half, a tenth of the current weight, whatever it is, um, if you can use and go back to the printed vehicles that some, through carbon fiber technology or powder-based metal deposition technology or whatever it is that allows you to, to make your vehicles lighter to, but still have the same amount of force protection, 
you're going to consume much less fuel. You're going to you're going to be able to. It's not just um, tactical maneuver; it's strategic or operational movement maneuver that I think you'll be able to help get at. The 30, 45, 90 day gap right now that prevents your TIPFID from getting things into theater quickly to, so the initial forces don't have to sit as long without help. Will this help that? I think it will. Um, is it because you're gonna make things forward? Maybe not in this case, but you'll probably be able to move things a lot quicker to get there. The other thing on the tactical side is you look at your, what's known as the modified combined obstacle overlay Right now, a 60-ton tank is not going to do well in certain pieces of terrain. You look into North Korea, for example, and you're trying to navigate through these things, it's going to be tough. But if you can have a much lighter vehicle to do the same things, you have more places you can go and more things you can do on site. The, uh, the next one is, is really interesting. Combat support hospitals can engineer human organs and synthetic fluids. So the advanced tissue biofabrication Manufacturing Institute is focused on being able to do just that. It can engineer, it can, it can create a kidney, it can create a liver, just to print it, to manufacture it, to whatever you want to call it. Um, it can do that with synthetic fluids. So I think to um, my second deployment, I was in Baghdad uh, during the surge, and how many of you guys know Greg Gadsden? You heard the story? Army football player. Um, I was the Brigade 3 in the unit that he was attached to. The night that he was um, on route uh, Irish and Jackson, where it comes together, and he lost both his legs or got injured very badly and lost both his legs. He was a battalion commander coming back from a memorial service down at Fob Falcon. And it took a lot of the patrols from the organizations to go in and actually line up for those that had the same blood type and just keep donating as much blood as was possible to keep him alive, him and the other hundreds and thousands like Greg that went through those, uh, those experiences. But if you, could, if you could create the synthetic fluids that could replace that, that method of producing that on time, you could get there. You, know, you, 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 could, have, you could have prevented potentially some of the outcomes uh, with that. Same with the human organs. One of the things that you gotta, that's cognizant of this, if you get a human organ wrong, you affect one person. If you get the synthetic fluids wrong, you affect a lot of people. So that's another thing, you know, all kinds of second and third order effects or considerations to think of. I talked about the next one. The radio is printed inside the buttstock or handguard or whatever you want of the individual weapon. Think uh, a flexible display that's on the side of the old M16 buttstocks, not the collapsible M4 buttstocks, where you can, you hold your weapon around a corner and you're actually looking at a display on your buttstock of what it is. And then you, you then, you do a quick conference, you know, you got safe, semi, and auto, and then it's VTC, <laughs> and you switch it over, and you're then talking to your, you know, platoon leader, or whatever it is, like, I don't know if we ought to go into this funnel right now. <laughs> Maybe we ought to get someone else to go around, or whatever it is. Um, it might help with targeting, it might help with a whole lot of things. And that's all in the art of the possible. The, uh, so, when I was a squadron commander in Iraq, the forward support company, we're at uh, Fob Sykes in Talifar, and, uh, Gary Valesky was my brigade commander, for those of you that know him. And uh, we were, the fight priority was in Mosul. And I, at the time, I, I remember wishing, I said, I wish we could just make our own freaking parts here because when I looked at the deadline report, all I see is things deadlined for parts on back order status. What if you could just have a, have a manufacturing platoon that could make a certain number of line items or all your items or whatever you needed right there in your forward support company? It would be fantastic, and it's all in the art of the possible. Um, I had some debate with some folks on this next one because um, I don't. I'm not convinced the efficiencies would be gained. But small arms munitions are fabricated in theater or fabricated forward as opposed to back. You could, if you could use, for instance, carbon fiber technology to make a munition or something. Would you want to do that forward in theater, or would you want to keep it back at where it is? I, I don't know what the answer is because you might consume just as much resources putting the bulk items forward as you would and the manufacturing processes as back. And I don't know what you'd really gain from doing that, but it's worth the debate. And then uh, this last one, there's a project going on where uh, in Samara, we dropped leaflets prior to attacking in. And when we went and asked how they did, and it was much more of a measure of performance than a measure of effectiveness because half the people couldn't read. Lyons was there. When, uh, Major Lyons was actually a lieutenant in the organization then. 
And you go in and you ask these farmers, and they're like, this is great, it helps me start my fire. But they can't read it, so you try to get away with pictures, and that really doesn't convey the message. But you actually can, the thickness of a piece of paper, you can have printed electronics inside of that piece of paper to where now, with the speaker, where the paper talks to you in the language that you want it to. So as soon as they pick the paper up and bend it, it'll activate it. Think like a greeting card technology, but actually a little bit thinner. And then there's additional technologies associated with that as well. So these are just some of the, the what ifs, get the juices flowing. And then you think, okay, so what? So what if you can do those things? But you gotta ask, and I know this is now getting into, this is the business of TRADOC. This is the business of the organization. How is this gonna change things? How is this gonna affect our warfighting functions? You know, we talked movement maneuver at the operational and tactical level, but, but there's any number of, of warfighting functions that are gonna be affected by this. The organizational purpose and design, I don't know that we'll ever change the purpose of our military organizations at the core level, but we've always changed the design over time, and I think it's just being ripe to do so. Um, these next few, medical and communications, tooth to tail, occupational specialties, what do signal companies look like? Are they squads in the future instead of companies? Are, they, uh, are there formations of manufacturing technicians? Uh, like I said, a manufacturing platoon that's at your forward support battalion or company uh, that, that can really focus on low volume, volatile demand because of the differences in your soldiers. The one about the tissue biofabrication is really, I think, a, an interesting one because you can, your combat support hospitals or your forward aid stations, depending on how you're set up, what if they could print certain tissues and things like that? So you're actually now fixing people forward and then evacuating them to recover as opposed to stabilizing, evacuating, and fixing them in the rear. So if your combat support hospital could, could manufacture the tissue before they, a burn victim got to BAMC in, in uh, San Antonio, what does that do to survivability and what's that look like? I think it's fascinating. The, uh, the tooth to tail, you think about this and the one thing that probably makes people crazy is what happens to contractors? I think they go up, maybe down if you, you then decide to put some of, the, some of these functions inside the service again. The, uh, there'll be lots of new MOSs in the future, just like uh, Career Management Field 17 for cyber recently. There'll be some other ones that'll come up. And then what, what's this whole discussion of what's the so what with regards to peer versus asymmetric versus hybrid threats? You know, if it's a peer threat and they're doing the same thing, it's, it's like, how are you getting an advantage? I think you're either left behind or you're doing it, one of these things. Um, joint interagency combined operations. You, if, if you're fighting in coalition activities and you leave your allies behind, how effective are you? You know, there's debate, and we all saw that, examples of pros and cons of that over the past few years. Um, I think back to Korea, and I was talking to some of our Korean allies. The, uh, we, in the, in the WMDE mission set with the 2ID, it was only possible through our ROC allies. And so in many cases, because they are a first world manufacturer and technology country, it was much easier, for instance, to integrate activities than it was in other parts of the world we've operated where you don't have that parity. So it's a, it's, it's a definite consideration. And then industry integration into service functions. The, uh, we do this now, think of a striker unit when it was first formed and the maintenance was performed by contractors with the organization that deployed with it. But what if more and more industry members actually built military business units of people to employ with the formation so it's much more blended? And how does that look with the titles of authorities and, and whatnot? It just, it's fascinating to me how, but I don't think anything should be off the table when creating these types of capabilities. Decision authorities and cycles, I thought, does the carbon fiber become the pacing item? <laughs> in theater as opposed to the end system because you want to, it's the item that can make the end system or make the components for it. Um, and then talent acquisition, management, and transition. These are all, these are all considerations that you got to think through. Right now, we were, when the draft ended, we went away from uh, credentials being the same in the service as they were in the outside. And now, we're starting to go back to that. Well, in this case, I think you want to have the same credential that's a 
certified production technician is the same certified person in the service and outside the service. That person can easily get a job, but it's also a great individual ready reservist or a reservist who can be called back up to do things. Um, so really, that's, that kind of just brings me to my last chart, which is there's a, uh, I love the quote in the um, TRADOC pamphlet 52531, the, the new, it's the TRADOC commander's introduction in the uh, operating concept. And it says, as the historian Sir Michael Howard observed, no matter how clearly one thinks, it's impossible to anticipate precisely the character of future conflict. The key is not to be so far off the mark that it becomes impossible to adjust once that character is revealed. And then the TRADOC commander goes on to say, our army must continuously learn, adapt, and innovate. And I'd argue, and finishing really with the quote from Michael Jordan, you're never gonna make a shot you don't take. So engage the institute. You got 14 of these institutes ready to work with you and for you, and if you wanna know how to do it, just get Eric's business card today. And that's how you do it. And it's easy to be part of that Venn diagram discussion as it moves forward in space than to watch it from a distance and hope it does what you need it to do by the time you get there. So I'll leave it with that and uh, ask both Dr. Eric Forsyth and Dr. Suresh Sitarman, if you guys wouldn't mind joining up on stage for any of the question and answer period and uh, open it up. I think we got 10 or 15 minutes for questions. Yeah, thanks. The after lunch coma has set in. Sir. So you mentioned the um, machine learning feeding back on the design for manufacturability. Um, I can see multiple points, multiple feedback points. Uh, one point could be in the original design layout. Another one could be in the sequence of steps for the manufacturing process in the CAM part of the CAD CAM. Um, another one entirely could be uh, a change to reduce manufacturing errors or, or uh, requirements for very exact tolerances so you have fewer um, fewer discarded parts in the mm, process. Yeah. Um, wh where do you see the most useful feedback um, in, in this context that would come from the uh, other, other end and that would help the most? Oh. What do you guys think? Want to jump in on that one? Sure. Uh, to... Hope we understand your question here in terms of what you are looking for. Uh, as you have the design, when it goes to the manufacturing, always we have discrepancies between what is designed and what is manufactured because the tolerances are not kept tight sometimes. The manufacturing processes are not appropriately calibrated to the design which is there. So several pathways are there depending on the fabrication process. If it is a component which is going to be cast as opposed to something which is going to be machined, as opposed to something which is going to be printed, right? Each one of these processes have its own uh, limitations associated with that. Ultimately, you are looking at where it is going to be used and what kind of stresses these are going to sustain. Although your physical component you can make today, and depending on the application, it may or may not be able to sustain the operation conditions. I'll give you an example. If you take turbine blades today, it takes a lot of effort, engine turbine blades, right? It takes a lot of effort to make those things, and it's an enormous cost. If there is a minor defect somewhere in one of the blades something, one of the proposals out there is to see, can I additively manufacture just that component to be able to replace it and still be able to do that? Technically, you can do that. It, it's going to look the same. But in terms of the strength and reliability, when you're starting off with powdered metal as opposed to a forged metal, is it gonna have the same result or not? And that's where institutes such as these manufacturing institutes, the uh, America Mix, is looking at how can we take something which can be custom made for a specific situation, uh, something that broke in the, in the field, can I substitute it? as appropriately with equal amount of reliability and, and customization as we move forward. So 
one of the uh, major difficulty um, for manufacturing parts uh, in some forward area is to have the right materials, the plastic, the carbon fiber, the uh, titanium or aluminum powder, whatever you use, right? Uh, you have to deliver it to, the, to that area, you have to store it there, you have to have it available on hand and so on. So the question is, uh, it would be nice if we could just use some local materials. You know, you, you, you cut some wood and you do something with that, or you pick up some sand and, um, and clay and you do something with that. Uh, or uh, more sophisticated materials that are more likely to be available in less developed areas. Does any of your institutes looking into this problem? In terms of the materials? In terms of how to take locally uh, available low-tech materials and do something meaningful with them. Yeah, I think you know that's a great point. Um, I don't know much about uh, the Recycled Materials in Remade Institute out of Rochester, New York, relatively new. Uh, month old, so <laughs> look it up, I guess. But I do know in context with um, the additive manufacturing, um, that's a great example where uh, the ma uh, America makes has certainly stimulated a lot of the additive manufacturing capability in manufacturing. Department of Defense is coming in there and saying exactly that kind of a problem. Here's our unique situation where we're in theater. We want to take pallets and convert them to, you know, gun stocks or something like this. Um, and so Department of Defense are coming in with the investments from America Makes and applying this new problem, coming in with their specific mission set and driving the broader investments from America Makes down to a specific application. And there are people within the additive manufacturing community of interest addressing exactly that question. In fact, I think I had an email today from something I owe somebody charts to. So uh, yes, <laughs> it, is a, it is a live conversation. And, and where do you, where in the supply chain do you decide to start this process? Do you want to assemble a set of um, subcomponent parts and then reduce your total end item so it's all more singular platform based? So that now you can just pick and choose from a list of 20 parts instead of 100 parts. Very simple uh, response, but I think that's part of the discussion as well. Recently at uh, a consumer electronics show in Las Vegas, I had, had the fortune of bumping into a company that will remain anonymous, but they had a printer that was able to do both flexible electronics and solid substrate electronics with uh, pick and place capability. Uh, and they demonstrated that for me that on a multi-level layer uh, device um, in about 22 minutes. You posed the question about how additive, additive manufacturing is going to change the Army. I pose a question on how additive manufacturing is going to change Silicon Valley and the industry, because if they don't adapt, they will die. Yeah, and um, I actually have one of those tools in my lab. So uh, we'd be happy to just talk to you about what our thoughts are around additive manufacturing. And again, that's a great example of, you know, the Flexible Hybrid Manufacturing Institute is worried about a $500 billion revenue industry and creating additional capabilities. But now taking that knowledge of how you create integrated electronics and package electronics to some other application space, something that's farther out there, 2020, and, and beginning to take rigid circuit boards, now flexible circuit boards, and now making them 3D circuit boards, and what are the advantages to do that? Um, I would always caveat that by um, today, uh, there are 1.2 billion smartphones um, shipped per year. So that's you know, five boards that are eight layers times 1.2 billion. Um, speed of manufacturing is critical to cost. And, and there needs to be a understanding of the additive space and how you deal with I just um, think there are opportunities that. to flirt with repair, sustainment of legacy systems, and quite frankly, moving from bring your own device to bring your own manufacturing. Yeah, exactly. And, and the institutes, mine in particular, um, we work a lot with uh, DMEA and, and other defense manufacturing activities that worry about exactly that problem. So we're making sure that forward, the, the, the near term parts of the Department of Defense are leveraging the institutes um, for exactly that reason, to be, begin thinking about how we're going to deal with 
legacy systems in this new manufacturing paradigms. Thanks, great, and, great lead in. And I think to your point, to your question also, it's that what, if Silicon Valley or any other place is gonna adopt it, it's gonna be because there's a business case to do so. They, we can't just say do this because it's the right thing. It's do this because you're gonna be able to make a better margin than you did the old way. Obviously. I predict we'll have a lot of empty fabs in about 20 years. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Hello. Yeah. Uh, Ernie from Arctic. Got a question. Uh, I see the uniform as a real estate. Okay. So the, when I look at a uniform, I says, what can I print into the uniform to lighten my load? Be a computer. As you know, you saw that most of the computer. And we've looked at what we've been looking at with the Navy is could the uniform become the interface to any platform? So instead of you having all these screens and all these electronics inside of the platforms, they are all embedded within your best. Once you enter the, the platform, whatever it is the platform, it identifies you and you communicate with it. Do you see that possibility of creating something like that? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Um, the FOA has a great video that, that kind of talks through that, that long-term vision. You know, certainly they're focused on nearer terms, but they're driving towards that. So if you're interested, by all means, look up uh, the, the advanced fiber and tissue, advanced fiber uh, manufacturing fabric. Can even, a FOA is all I, right, a FOA. Look up a FOA's. Yeah. yeah, and then the other, you know, it's being able to not just be something that interacts with the platform, but interacts with your body. So it tells you all the things about the physiological things about you, and then communicates that outside as well as performing the other functions. So if it's like a vehicle, it's the asset monitoring that we're talking about, where the technology now we have, uh, you can have flexible electronics around gas lines, pipes, so that you don't have to dig them up to do the maintenance on them, you just monitor the structural health remotely. But you can kind of do the same thing with your, your a human being, and then when something needs to be maintained, you can, main, you can do so in a better way. I, I think a great application is, we were very worried doing the WMD mission is your rate of exposure over time is cumulative to people. So how do you use your uniform to monitor that but then also transmit it to the physician assistants or your division surgeon or whomever to monitor this so they knew when a organization, while externally was completely healthy, had reached their limit of exposure and were no longer available for that mission set. These are, these are like when it gets down to the weeds, that's the type of so what I think is important to sort through. Thank you. And just one final follow on. I think that's a great example of two institutes who have very different manufacturing paradigms uh, coming together to solve a common problem, electronics packaging and the advanced fibers. Can I jump in back here with uh, another question from our online chat? Um, We've got somebody who's, who's interested in hearing a little bit about what some of the management and streamlining challenges are when you start talking about supply chains that take this kind of hybrid form with some central production and uh, some localized 3D printing. I'll, I'll talk just one of our members for our institute. Um, what comes to mind with that question is the OEMs. Um, so Jable or Flex or there are two, two members of our institute, they're competitors, but they have the, uh, these they have to track everything in the supply chain, and they do a great job as, with the asset visibility. And what's key is it's not just human data entry that allows them to monitor it, it's the items themselves populate that asset visibility of everything. So they, they know where their risks are, they know how to mitigate it, they know where natural disasters are gonna influence um, their supply chain. They, they have alternate supply chain members. Um, and so I think the management of that is largely done through the asset visibility of just mapping it out and then using the, the tools available to see it in its entirety. If, if hopefully that answers the question. Yeah. Well, good afternoon. Okay, um, my name is Alpha Crane. I work at Tradoc in Arctic, and I had a couple questions that came to my great speech um, presentation um, about um, the possibility. You were talking about printing fibers, and what are the possibilities of a soldier coming into initial military training, or a forward deployed soldier, or a unit of special operations guys getting ready to deploy somewhere, to just have a body scan, and then they get a tailor fit uniform um, printed in whatever design or camouflage is needed, 
Um, and what also, when would, when do you see that possibility, like boots too, and cold weather gear? And also, what about reactive fiber, like fiber that could act as its own ballistic vest, like when it would sense the, the bullet or the fragment and figure out, hey, I need to solidify or do whatever to absorb it so it doesn't pierce the, the armor? Yeah. Yeah. Sure. So uh, there, are, there are two components to this question. When do you see uh, looking at your image to create the appropriate clothing that, that is correct for you? And there, uh, the technology and the algorithms are there today in terms of taking the dimensions to be able to translate it to something that can be fitted to that particular individual that is there. Uh, but more importantly, what we need to be looking at is, uh, unlike cell phones and other things, unless you take it with you, it's not traveling with you all the time. Clothing is something which you're going to wear all the time. It's going to be with you all the time, right? So. Uh, at least when, when you're outside. Uh, the, the, the idea is that if we incorporate uh, electronics in the clothing, for example, one of my colleagues at Georgia Tech, he is working on clothing for military personnel, which has got embedded electronics. It does several things. It not only monitors, it can potentially monitor your heart function, your temperature, your pressure, and things like that. But also it's got woven uh, electronics in it. And if that particular soldier is hit by, uh, by any, anything, if you will, if the soldier is injured, and essentially it will find out at what location the bullet or he is hit, and that information, because of where it is pierced, will be automatically communicated through the antenna in the vest to a different location so that people can decide should we attend on this soldier right away, or somebody else is more critical than this person? So the, the vest or the shirt, smart shirt, that the soldier wears, not only functions as a communication device, but also an, an immediate emergency call from the soldier to some, someone else who needs to be attending to it. In all of these things, to be able to power these things, some of them will have enough power to move on, but some of them may not have enough power because you are deployed over a long period of time. So how do we, you don't want to burden a soldier, if you will, with heavy batteries and things like that. So for certain other applications, you could potentially think about sending drones, which will be able to charge the electronics on the soldier wirelessly. So the soldier is walking through, drones fly in, they charge their electronics as appropriate. So various ways uh, Nextflex and the, the members are working on in terms of advancing some of these things. So I'll, I'll, I'll close, I know we're getting the hook. The, uh, it's not just the manufacturing institutes, it's groups like the Manufacturing Demonstration Facility at Oak Ridge, it's um, the Hacking for Defense Initiative that's at uh, many different colleges around the country. And uh, it's all these things, it's all part of this ecosystem that just engage and be a part of the conversation, help, help, help generate the problems that these organizations can help you solve. So thank you all. Thank you.